Thank you so much. First of all, that, that is what I wanted to say is um, thank you to Neurodiversity Ireland for hosting us. There have been over 800 um, subscribed for the talk tonight. Uh, Teresa and I are both very passionate about this topic. Um, our main challenge, however, in our jobs is getting this information to people, um, factual information on ARFID, um, and also supportive strategies to the families. So uh, by creating this platform for us, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity for us to do that. So thank you for that. Um, Teresa and I, I suppose the two main issues that we experience in our work with children and families with ARFID is a lack of appropriate team-based pathways um, support and assessment for uh, children with ARFID. So not only is there a lack of, of services specifically for these children, but even if you are in a service such as a CDNT, there isn't um, in many of the teams appropriate pathways for these children. Um, then in addition, then in addition to that, to that uh, lack of um, support, there is also a lack of awareness um, just in kind of society at large. By virtue of the fact that it is a relatively recent uh, diagnosis, um, and it is by far, I would say, the most misunderstood area of need that I work with on the CDNT uh, here in Wicklow. Um, so tonight, Teresa and I, are, we're delighted to be able to maybe build on this awareness and understanding on this topic and also provide some practical ideas on how you can support your child. So um, just the agenda for tonight. So. Um, Michelle, as you said, we're just going to introduce ourselves briefly and our experience of working with ARFID and where we're coming from. We will talk about what ARFID is and what it's not, and hopefully dispel some of the myths that are out there in relation to ARFID. Uh, we will talk a bit about the lived experience of ARFID. So many people feel that this is, you know, quite a, a physical um, and psychological issue, which it is, but there's also many more um, societal, environmental factors that we need to consider um, in working with children with ARFID. And then we'll come on to the, the juicy bit, to the strategies, and Teresa will cover the, the sensory occupational therapy side of the strategies, and I'll cover the more psychological aspects. And then we'll jump into a Q&A at the end. And um, as Michelle has said, any questions that you put in the chat, they do get recorded, and we are happy to answer them um, after this uh, webinar if we don't get to them this evening. So, so don't feel too aggrieved if we don't get to your, your question. Um, so just uh, before we get started, really, just uh, a disclaimer of sorts, I suppose, is that um, obviously this workshop is, I suppose, for Teresa and I, we describe it almost as a whistle stop uh, version or tour of um, of ARFID in terms of the the information that we can provide in the space of an hour. Um, so it isn't a substitute for professional help. I know that might seem obvious, but nevertheless, it's just important to point that out. Um, it is aimed more towards younger people with ARFID and it is more um, psychoeducational as opposed to it being an individualised intervention plan for your child. So some of the strategies that we mentioned, they might be suitable for your child. Others may need to be tweaked and others may not be suitable at all. Um, so just to, to bear that in mind. Um, we will ask you uh, to try where possible just to um remove distractions and really um focus if you can on the webinar tonight easier said than done i have three kids i know what it's like i'm hoping that they don't interrupt me um doing this um but honestly you know the research says that if you have a pen and paper to hand um taking some notes does kind of consolidate that information back in into your your memory um and also, I, I do a lot of these parent workshops and um, the feedback is always that, you know, uh, when they do make the notes, they do remember the practical strategies. So get out a post-it and write down maybe three or four takeaway strategies that you know you'll be able to implement with your child as soon as you finish this webinar. Um, so just to uh, introduce our, ourselves, um, Teresa will be coming on uh later on um but just i'll introduce her so she is a pediatric occupational therapist with um 16 years experience working with infants and children uh she's also a specialist feeding therapist and she was actually part of the team that established the first service for children with complex feeding challenges in ireland and i know she'll mention that a bit later on 
um, and she works quite a bit with ARFID in her private practice. Um, I am a principal clinical psychologist. Um, I work across four different CTNTs in three in Wicklow, one in South Dublin. Um, I have 15 years experience of working with neurodivergent children and young people. Um, and I, when working with children with ARFID, um, you know, I'll always highlight the need for a team based approach. Um, but my focus is usually on the, the high emotion that surrounds it and in particular the anxiety that both drives the, um, the eating difficulty or challenge, um, but also the anxiety that the parents experience as a result of this um, eating challenge. So um, do bear in mind as well that tonight we've had quite a diverse number of people join our, our call tonight. Uh, we've had people like GPs, dietitians, teachers, families, um, quite a number of, of different people with different backgrounds and different levels of knowledge when it comes to ARFID. And we have um, taken that into consideration in developing this workshop and we're trying our best, I suppose, to address the, the different levels of awareness or information that people may have or not have. Um, so I guess the most important bit is uh, describing or, or explaining what ARFID is. So I think what sets ARFID apart really from your regular or, or more developmentally appropriate selective eating is the severity of it. So it's an ongoing disruption. I mean, persistent disruption to eating patterns that results in um, nutrition and or weight being significantly impacted. And we'll come on to kind of how a diagnosis is made um, a bit later on. Um, or there are significant challenges then, of course, to eating certain foods. Um, this comes, however, without that, you know, fear of weight gain or the body image challenges that you people typically associate with eating um, challenges or eating disorders. Uh, so you don't have that concern about their appearance or that desire to maintain a certain weight. Typically, it's uh, it's a there's a younger onset. Um, because I guess that cognitive capacity, you know, to develop um, fears about weight and all that, you know, that is, you see that at a later age, whereas this is a more fear-based or a sensory-based eating difficulty. Um, it's one of the, the six feeding and eating disorders recognized by the World Health Organization. Um, and, you know, I suppose most importantly, this is not just selective eating or, as we know, more colloquially as uh, fussy or picky eating. Uh, it's far, it's more severe than that. And the consequences on the child's everyday life are more severe. So, as I said earlier, it is a relatively recent diagnosis. Um, so there's kind of two classification systems that people use to diagnose different um challenges or conditions. One is the DSM, which is more American based, and the ICD-11 then uh, is, that's the one we use more frequently in Ireland in the, our healthcare system. So ARFID only came into the DSM in 2013, and then it appeared in ICD-11 in 2018. So that is why a lot of clinicians still aren't fully aware of, of this condition. Plus, um, even in, you know, America, where there is a lot more known about this and it's more researched, it's still considered kind of a new enough, newly emerging enough uh, condition. Um, thankfully, though, the, the emergence, you know, people have mixed views about putting labels on challenges and calling it a, a condition versus a challenge. But for many, their experience of this eating challenge has been really validated by the diagnosis because finally they feel, well, you know, this actually describes my child. You know, people weren't believing me. And now I have this um, title or this ARFID to actually describe to people, look, this is what my child is experiencing. Um, so the prevalence rate in Ireland, it's very difficult to identify because we're still in that stage where we're not even, I suppose, uh, fully up to speed with making accurate kind of diagnosis, never mind gathering the, the stats on that. But in America, it, the, the prevalence is kind of between 0 0.5 and 5% of young people. Um, so the next bit here is is actually so important in terms of the identifying an appropriate intervention or support for ARFID. We need to, you know, as in all psychological issues or behavioral problems, we need to know the function of the, the behavior. Um, 
before we can then address it. So why is it that the, the child is experiencing such difficulty? And we can I kind of categorize the reasons into three main reasons. So the first one is um, sensory sensitivity, which Teresa will uh, talk about in a while. Um, so sensory sensitivity to sensory aspects of food, like the texture, the taste, the smell, or the appearance of food. Um, there's also a fear of the second kind of main reason that has been identified is a fear of something bad happening. So the child might have had a very significant um, near choking uh, experience, or they may have had a really bad vomiting bug um, or an anaphylactic reaction. And subsequent to that, they become terrified of the particular food in question. So their little amygdala, their emotion brain or their survival brain has a really, really strong memory of that event that almost potentially took their life and is their amygdala is protecting them then really by not letting them near that food that nearly took their life. So um, that's kind of very simply describing the fear reaction there. Um, but yeah, so there it can come when there has been a traumatic association with either a food or feeding. So often if a child may be um, for medical reasons where there was enteral feeding or, or, or tube feeding for a period of time and that was very aversive for them, that can also lead to heightened fear around feeding. Um, then a third kind of reason is a child that just has a lack of interest in eating. There's just a lack of motivation to eat. Maybe they're very easily distracted or highly aroused by other things in their environment. Um, or they may have issues with what we call interoception, which is the, the process of um, sensing the signals from the body. So that sometimes children with interoceptive difficulties might find it difficult to know when to go to the toilet. They might find it difficult to know how hot or cold they are or how hungry they are. Um, so we move on then to how is a diagnosis made? And I know in Ireland, like this is a bit of a minefield at the moment because you have some people that are willing to give a diagnosis, professionals that are willing to give a diagnosis on their own, some that will only do it as part of a team um, or some that won't do it at all and maybe give a diagnosis of um, possible ARFID or suspected ARFID, for example. And um, I understand everyone's position, actually, I, uh, because there are no very clear pathways, really, um, apart from in one, one centre uh, for, for the diagnosis of ARFID in, in Ireland at the moment. So this slide here has been actually taken from the Maudsley ARFID clinic over in London. Um, and where there is a psychiatrist, psychologist, dietitians and OTs on the, the team there. And really what you're looking for is one or more of those four uh, areas there with the, the little ticks in them. So you're looking for significant weight loss and or nutritional deficiency that's significant again and or having to um, use alternative feeding methods um, and or psychosocial impairment. So what I mean by psychosocial impairment is that it really is impacting on their everyday quality of life. You, you want to think function. So, you know, their ability to attend school or to go to lunches or to go to parties, are they're all being affected. Dinner time is hugely affected at home. Um, so in the red boxes then, these are kind of, um, these indicate times when it isn't ARFID really that we're talking about. So for example, if you, if for whatever reason, you're a family that only eats fruit and vegetables and that's all you provide to your child and that, therefore that is all your child eats, then that isn't ARFID obviously. You know, it's not that they're afraid of other foods, it's that they haven't been exposed to them. Um, so the common practice on that just kind of refers to, you know, it's not your common selective eating that's kind of more developmentally appropriate where the child actually does maintain a regular weight and they kind of you know they move out of that phase over time um it shouldn't be explained by another condition such as anorexia for example um and we what we don't see are uh weight and shape concerns as well so i hope that slide um you know there is a playback so you will be able to go back onto this and, and have a look at this if it, if um you can't remember it right now uh, so other additional characteristics then, which you're all very aware of, I'm sure, are um, the child will eat very few foods. OK, so, you know, I know some children that, that there might only be two or three foods that they eat. Um, 
There's also a strong reliance on certain brands of food because the, they look the same, they taste the same, they smell the same, they feel the same in their mouth. Um, and, you know, there can be a huge issue if the branding changes. I've, I've seen this in, in um, you know, just if the package changes, there's a huge fear that what's inside it will also be aversive. Um, so we see extreme anxiety if the non-preferred foods aren't there. Um, we can see it almost a disgust response. Uh, or as I've said later on, there a physical response such as gagging or even almost vomiting. So it's a real visceral response. And I think that's one of the hallmarks as well, is that when the response to the, the challenging food is so um, visceral and uh, what's the word, um, almost feral, you know, it, it's I think that is it's, so, it's a real sign that this is not put on you know um it's not something that they are choosing um it's a real uh it's a real response i suppose um we also see hypervigilance as well and that is more in children where they've experienced um maybe near choking or vomiting so they maybe become hypervigilant of for example another child in the class that they think might be sick and they're afraid of even looking at them vomiting because that'll mean that they might vomit and so yeah you get anxiety that manifests in different ways. Um, another point then is that it's often seen with um, with autism, but it's not exclusively linked. And that is a kind of a misunderstanding or a myth maybe that's out there is that it's only occurs alongside autism, which isn't the case. Um, so just on that, I suppose the next bit is a little bit about ARFID and autism. So eating problems, they are not an inevitable or a fixed aspect of autism. Um, there are some autistic individuals that have um, no eating challenges, and then there are some that, that do. Um, and you, you may have an autistic person that has sensory aversions to certain types of food, but that wouldn't meet the criteria for ARFID because it's not significantly impacting on their weight or their nutritional uh, well-being or their quality of life enough. Um, so some common misconceptions then um, is that eating difficulties characteristic of ARFID are all part of autism or autistic eating and so that you don't need to diagnose or or manage them in their own right. Um, but that is not the case. You know, this is, is a separate um, issue that absolutely requires appropriate um, support in its own right. Um, There's a misconception that the avoidance and restriction is always sensory. Um, that's not the case. It's almost impossible to disentangle um, the sensory system from the emotional system because they're actually sensory and, and emotion that is processed in the same part of our brain. So if something is causing a sensory aversion, um, there will, by virtue of where it's processed in the brain, be an anxiety response or an emotional response tied in with that as well. Um, there's also a belief that um, you know, if you continue to expose uh, your child to food, that you will cure it. And, and unfortunately, um, that isn't always the case. And, you know, I don't like to talk about cures anyway, um, but it, it's more uh, that uh, the, the approach that is best taken, I suppose, is focusing on living with um, the challenges. But yes, over time, exposure might help. Um, but I suppose it's not a fix that um, that we're looking for. It's more living with and managing the, the nutritional risk, really, that's associated uh, with ARFID. Um, so the next uh, slide is uh, talking about actually research that has been done, thankfully, on young people that have experienced ARFID. So there's really very limited research out there at all on ARFID. Um, Never mind, you know, hearing the voices of children that are experiencing it. Um, and I think, you know, as clinicians, we often make assumptions about what it might be like and, you know, what they need. But th this research study in particular was actually very um, insightful in terms of knowing what it was like for a young person that was experiencing it. So they talked about in this research study um, how they experienced unpleasant bodily sensations like their skin crawling and just the, the, the sensation in their mouth um, in response to certain foods um, and also how they, they felt that food was a threat and actually increased their, their threat response and their 
um, the cortisol in their body and all that, they could actually feel that stress response in their body. Um, there was the branded products, uh, you know, there, there was a definite leaning towards um, a preference for branded products, again, because they're predictable. Um, there was many areas of their life that were affected. You know, um, I know Teresa will talk about how ingrained food and eating is in our social life. Uh, so it affected, you know, their school, their hobbies and their social lives. Um, they felt that most of the adults around them, which is probably true, including professionals, didn't appear to understand ARFID. Um, and then there was obviously then a lack of belief and invalidation from others that led to shame about what they were experiencing, which then compounds the difficulties that they're experiencing. And so to cope with this, they controlled their food as much as they could. And they also kind of controlled their support network as well. Um, so the impact then of ARFID on the wider family, it, you know, there is quite a bit of research on this and it is quite significant. Um, it impacts not only um, the child, but kind of all domains of family life. It can be quite stressful for family and relatives. Um, feeding our children, it's such, uh, you know, an innate desire or a drive for us to do. You know, we're, we're, we're born to help our children to survive its evolution um so it brings about real fear and panic is... when we were unable to or when we have challenges in this area and we feel you know parent guilt is huge as it is never mind if you're struggling to give food to your child the guilt can be exceptionally strong as can shame even though this is not your fault as a parent and nor is it your child's fault and i think even take removing the word fault is a much better place to be in um, it can also cause social isolation um, because of the events that you have to maybe uh, not go to if there's food involved. Um, obviously, then, with all of these factors, there can be mood issues and financial implications, um, depending on the types of food that you're having to buy and the services that you're having to um, buy for your or use for your child. Um, ARFID, the, the uh, uh, support for it or treatment of it is quite prolonged it takes a lot of time um like persistence and perseverance and that can often lead to feelings of burnout especially if you're the parent that's taken the, the brunt of it um with healthy eating policies in school you know the, and the lack of understanding then of, of ARFID in schools the relationship with school can take a hit as can relationships within the family and overall, then, I suppose this does lead to all of these things together can impact on, on your quality of life. Um, so I know that all sounds quite negative, but what we want to do, I suppose, is help any professionals out there to understand just how um, expansive, I suppose, the, the, the negative experience can be. Um, and we are now going to move on to um, Teresa, who's going to talk about how to support all of these different challenges. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, it's lovely to talk to you all this evening. And uh, as Rebecca said, I have been fortunate enough to work with children with uh, various forms of complex feeding difficulties for several years now. Um, and most recently uh, at my own clinic in Susan Stars Occupational Therapy, I do see children who come to me for a specific support around ARFID, um, either diagnosed, suspected or complex feeding difficulties. So I hope um, in the second half of this presentation that the information here coupled with the evidence, which I refer to a lot, okay. will, will help you to um, discover some supportive strategies in the four kind of domains that we've presented here. So, sorry, Rebecca is my... Um, my mouse user here tonight. Thanks, Rebecca. So I'm just going to talk firstly about some of the guiding principles that I use um, when I'm working with families who are experiencing ARFID challenges with their children. So I suppose the first one is that I see feeding very much as a, a relationship based practice. And this means that, as we all know, um, as parents and caregivers, from the moment we meet our new baby and take them into our arms, the first thing we do is 
feed them. And, um, you know, we we celebrate all of their milestones and feeding is a huge one of those, as you can see here by the little baby covered in, in puree of broccoli or pea or some, some sort. Um, and when this goes well, it's fantastic. It's a huge thing to be celebrated. But actually, the research shows that when feeding difficulties occur, and, and particularly ARFID and very complex feeding difficulties, it can have a huge relationship on the, the caregiver child bonding, attachment, uh, and it can go so far as to cause trauma in that relationship between the child and the parent. For um, feeding changes to occur, we need to have sensory and emotional security, both for the child and for the caregiver. And you'll hear me talk uh, throughout these slides about the concept of regulation and co-regulation, and I'll refer to that a few times. But if we don't feel safe in our own sensory environment, then we cannot um, make any progress with feeding difficulties. And I also want to refer, refer to the concept of responsive feeding. So this is, again, a very, very generalized way of explaining responsive feeding. But that means that when we're working with these children who have ARFID, that we allow them to lead the way. And this can be hugely challenging for us as parents and caregivers, because we may see the child dropping food, saying they don't like it. I have enough. I'm not hungry. And you're going, oh, my God, you need to eat you must be starving, you must be fatigued, you must feel awful, you need energy to play and learn and concentrate. But we have to move at their level, as difficult as that is. As parents, we provide the opportunities for feeding to occur. And that's as much as we can do. We cannot actually do any more than that. And I'll, I'll explain that uh, concept a little bit more later. But our role is to provide the opportunities for children to meet food in a way that provides that sensory security that we spoke about and not with any pressure in the feeding environment. So some of you may recognize the, the healer family here. Um, I love this episode where the children cook the dinner for the mom and dad on the date night and you can see their fear um, as they're presented with the various foods. I suppose in my work with families with ARFID, you know, meal times are constantly a source of stress, and anxiety and frustration and despair and parents talk to me all the time about I can't get the food into them I can't get the nutrition into them what am I going to do and I suppose for a moment I want us just to reflect on all of the other things that happen at family meal times because it's so eating is so much more than just getting the calories in basically and it's very easy to lose sight of that when we are struggling with feeding difficulties in the family home, such as ARFID. So, you know, for, there's loads of different things listed here, but things like family connection, attachment, curiosity about new food that you might see on the plates of others, autonomy, the little child learning to say, no, thank you, or throwing the food on the floor when they've had enough, family time together, communication, and learning is a huge thing for children and families as we eat together. So, learning about the family routines around food, whatever that might look like in your home, feeding skills, learning to use a knife and fork or learning to eat with hands, role modeling, and even as parents and caregivers, learning to recognize our child's hunger cues. Because as Rebecca referred to earlier, for children with ARFID, sometimes they don't feel hunger in the same way that you or I might. And so we sometimes have to work very hard and do a lot of detective work to recognize what those hunger cues are. The impact then of ARFID on the, the mealtime environment is that I suppose I feel. Yeah, Arf no. ARFID can be both, uh, the environment can both hinder or enhance eating for mm. children with ARFID. So uh, I suppose. Some children are very, very heavily reliant on eating in a specific environment. So that can be the home environment, the school environment, where they feel that security that I spoke about. And then the, the other side of that is that when they leave that familiar and safe environment, they don't feel comfortable to eat in any way. Um, I will talk a little bit more in a moment about the impact of the sensory environment and the child's specific sensory profile and the, the impact of the environment on that. Um. 
they, the wider kind of mealtime environment can impact the child's regulation and also their readiness to eat, which is huge. One thing that I encounter a lot when I work with children with ARFID is that we need to be very, very flexible about how, where and when these children eat. So I suppose, you know, most of us grew up with, you know, you sit at the table, you eat everything on your plate, you wait until everyone is finished. And look, in an ideal world, that's great. But that does not work for these children. So we definitely need to, I suppose, manage our own expectations. And it can be challenging to do that. And particularly, perhaps if there's other family members present, um, you know, and lots of opinions, that can be a real challenge. Again, thinking about the, the mealtime routine, and how often we present food to children with ARFID. So again, you know, we might be used to our typical three meals a day and two snacks. The evidence shows that children with ARFID, again, mainly because of their reduced hunger signals, do much better with eating when they're given short, frequent opportunities to eat food. And so they probably won't come to you looking for food, or if they do, it might not be as frequently as other children. So one of the things when I spoke about parents providing those opportunities is that we give them the opportunity to eat on regular intervals but for short periods. If we're going to consider changing anything to do with the feeding environment, so for example, as lots of families do when they, when they come to me with these challenges, if they really want to get the child back to the table or even back into the kitchen, when the rest of the child are eating dinner. Because for a lot of these children, even being in the room with other people who are eating food that is not on their list of preferred foods can just be too much and too overwhelming. So the main thing to consider when we are making any sort of environmental changes is that it's extremely slow and child-led. Thanks, Rebecca. So. Next, I'm going to look at sensory processing. I mean, I could have spent the whole of the, the talk tonight simply looking at sensory processing in relation to ARFID. It's, it's a very complex area, but I suppose to look at it in very general terms here tonight, I'm going to look primarily at the areas of sensory hypersensitivity and then sensory hypo or undersensitivity. This, again, is not the full picture, but I just kind of want to present to you some of the most typical presentations that I see in my clinic in relation to children with ARFID. So these children with hypersensitivity to sensory input are the ones that you see, you know, you immediately see the hands going up. No, it's too much. Their little sensory systems don't have a big threshold for all the different types of sensory input. So these are the children who don't like getting their hands or face messy. If their face gets dirty or their hands are dirty, they're immediately looking for the hands to be cleaned. And they tend to be the little ones. The parents will tell me that when they were weaning them, they were fine with the purees on the spoon, but immediately as soon as they moved on to, you know, the more lumpy food and um, the, the veg or whatever that wasn't pureed, that was where they ran into trouble. And they tend to dislike food that is in any way kind of lumpy or um, more difficult to chew. These tend to be the children who dislike food touching on their plate. And again, they often struggle with the smell and the sight of other meals at the table. Some of these children with ARFID have such a visceral um, response to the sensory input of other foods that often these children will physically gag at the smell of other people's meals at the same table as them. These are also the children who will be very, very highly alert to the appearance or packaging of food. So for example, you know, if somebody put two digestive biscuits in front of me, one from one supermarket and one from the other, I wouldn't be able to tell you the difference. However, these children, because they're so hyper vigilant and hyper anxious to the appearance, the smell, the taste, the texture of food, they will be able to fish that out, as I'm sure many of you know, in a couple of seconds. And also, as Rebecca referred to earlier, packaging can be a huge thing for these children because packaging indicates sameness and sameness in indicates security. Oftentimes, these children may experience either over sensory overwhelm and they can shut down, or as I said, they can have some type of physical response where they just cannot be in the room with, with different types of food and smells. On the other hand, then, children who present as hyposensitive or undersensitive to sensory input and registration of sensory input in their body 
may not have the ability to recognize their own or tune into their own hunger signals. So they may not recognize when they're hungry, may not recognize when they're full. These can be the children who you will sometimes see overstuffing the food into their mouth. Um, these are often the children who come to me and the parents are saying, oh yeah, they'll, they'll eat every single thing in the house that's not food. So they're the children you see chewing on the pen, chewing on their sleeves, you know, biting any kind of plastic thing that they can get their hands on but then they only want to eat food that is dry, crunchy and bland. So on the next slide, uh, I just, uh, lots of you may have seen this video already, but I find it really powerful. This video is um, a boy in a shopping center who has autism and who has sensory hypersensitivity, sorry, hypersensitivity. It doesn't specifically relate to food, but I think it's a super example of how it must feel for somebody who has this profile and how I suppose overwhelming and triggering the environment for somebody like this is on a daily basis. Hopefully this works now. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. So I don't know about you, but I definitely feel a little bit uh, overwhelmed and triggered after watching that video. I definitely am a little bit sensory hypersensitive myself. And I suppose I when I watched that for the first time, I just thought, imagine feeling like that every day. And particularly if you're somebody with ARFID, that that is potentially how you feel every time you walk into a kitchen. Never mind even make it as far as the table to sit down and try and put some food into your mouth. It's it's very, very anxiety provoking for these children. So on the next slide, I'm just going to give some very, very general sensory strategies for mealtimes. As I said, when I first meet children with ARFID or uh, feeding difficulties, I spend a lot of time with the child and the parent exploring their own individual sensory profile and preferences. And then as part of that, we look at what their own specific sensory triggers are and where those sources of sensory overwhelm lie for that particular child or young person, because that varies so much from individual to individual. Um, you know, no more than somebody with autism, you meet one child with ARFID, you've only met one child with ARFID. Every single child I've met has a different sensory profile and, and different sensory preferences. What I found in the past works is to... Um, empower parents and caregivers and maybe teachers as well or grandparents um, to have, I, I suppose, a sensory toolkit on hand, particularly in relation to mealtimes. So, you know, that can include um, their the, the child's sensory, maybe their, their, sorry, I'm having a word finding difficulties, things like fidget toys and um, weighted equipment that they might like to have with them at the table. Um, maybe they need to go off and have a movement break before they even come as far as the, the kitchen to eat. Um, you know, maybe having some lovely proprioceptive input outside of the kitchen before they come as far as it. So you will know your own child's sensory preferences best and how to engage those in helping them to feel that sensory security for mealtimes. You know, other very broad-based strategies that help are keeping things, as I'm sure lots of you already know, very predictable, very safe, routine-based, because that is where we reduce the anxiety and increase that sense of security. Keeping safe food safe. I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about sensory, uh, about strategies for success. Um, but I suppose one thing that I want to talk about in terms of positive exposures to food this can include helping the child to meet new foods, but it doesn't always have to mean eating foods, you know, in the first instance. So it can be things that I've um, encouraged parents to do are 
in the first instance, asking children to help set the table, but no pressure to eat after that with everybody else. Things like um, if they feel comfortable doing it, even maybe squeezing the lemon onto food for other members of the family. But again, that's as far as they have to go. No preference to, to eat any of the food after that. Even things like unpacking the groceries, looking at what you brought home in the shopping this week. These are all really positive exposures, but there's no pressure involved. In my experience, when we're introducing new foods, when the child is ready, we, we need to adopt that sensory lens. And I always tell parents, to change one tiny minuscule thing if you're going to do this. So for example, if you have a child who loves chicken dippers, I might tell them to literally cut the chicken dipper in half so you're changing the appearance of it slightly. And that might be as much as the child's sensory system is able to cope with at that time because it will look slightly different. Other examples might be to change the brand of the chicken dipper if you think your, your child can cope with that. But that is because these children are usually so hypersensitive that's this very, very slow level of change we need to be working with. So just back to me for a few minutes, um, just to cover some of the, the psychological supports that we can use when working with uh, children with ARFID. So um, similar to Teresa, I could probably do a whole workshop alone on these. So um, trying to summarize them is, is tricky, but I'll do my best. Um, so as Teresa has mentioned, uh, and as we could really feel in that video, I certainly could anyway, the anxiety of that child um, as he went through that sensory experience, it, you know, it was escalating and elevating. And um, by far, anxiety is one of the, the biggest emotions that we see uh, when it comes to ARFID and the one that I work with the most. Um, so one of the first things um, or ideas or strategies um, that I feel works quite well is similar to what uh, Therese has mentioned in relation to the sensory exposure, is this idea of graded exposure. So you're gradually introducing the child to the foods over time and in different ways. Um, there, there's kind of a, I, I use the three P's idea with this one. So persistence, patience and playfulness. Um, you know, it can take a long time before your child is even comfortable touching a certain food. Um, so, you know, persistence with this is important, but equally so is a bit of fun and, and playfulness around it. If you can, because I find that with families, it gets so serious and intense. Um, but our kids, in order to, they, they learn through fun and play. And it adds a bit of levity to a situation for, for us as parents as well. So um, ideas like food art, um, you know, making things on a, on a plate, playing restaurant where your um, child maybe is the chef, God forbid, could, could be a bad idea. But um, going to farms, um, seeing where vegetables come from, you know, getting them to understand um, where food is made, where it comes from can help. Um, growing your own vegetables, um, baking, shopping with your child. So similar ideas to what um, Teresa has mentioned. And again, it brings in that nice kind of co-regulation bit as well. If you focus more on um, the fun aspects of food rather than always focusing on, on the eating aspect. And then in time, then you can hopefully introduce um, the, the eating aspect. And the idea of doing this over time, by the way, from a kind of a neuropsychological or neurobiological perspective is you're basically over time you're telling that fear part of their brain and in their amygdala that this is safe so every time they have a safe experience with food um that amygdala quietens down a little bit until you reach such a point as it's quiet enough for them to maybe touch the food or put it to their mouth um another technique that is there is some emerging evidence for is a uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that's specific um to arfid um, this kind of four stages to it. I, I won't get into it. It is more suitable, however, just to say for children that have, I suppose, um, a more advanced kind of cognitive abilities. So they're that bit older. So they're maybe around, depends on your child, but anywhere from eight up, um, it, it's more suitable for that age range. And what it focuses on really is challenging kind of certain thoughts um, that are irrational um, around food. So for example, 
if I eat um, that grape, it will definitely choke me. I, I will die if I eat that grape. So gradually over time, um, trying to get them to um, test those th thoughts and then try out how rational they are. Do they come true? Um, using the idea of cognitive restructuring, but also giving them the skill to help themselves feel calm in that moment where they are trying the quarter piece of grape. So things like um, breathing exercises, mindfulness. We saw the guy in the video there counting. So he was using that distraction to focus um, on something else other than the sensory overload. Um, there's emerging evidence as well for family-based treatment around ARFID. I think that that's kind of the basic premises of our workshop tonight really is that it is a family based approach because it, it involves the family, particularly when we're talking about children. But one of the main um, things underpinning this is this idea of externalization. So uh, what happens oftentimes with ARFID um, is that uh, the child becomes the problem. Um, rather than us seeing as seeing ARFID as separate to the child. So it's like saying, oh, the whole child or, you know, we, we see ARFID uh, uh, and the child kind of almost as one, um, but it's trying to um, externalize the problem. So taking it out of the child, seeing this ARFID here, out here, and often, you know, with families, I nearly draw it like, so this is the, the ARFID person out here. And then here's mom, dad, and, and Johnny, and we're all on the same team. And we're trying to figure out how to manage this ARFID fellow over here, right? So rather than seeing the child as the problem. Um, so that approach can, can be very helpful. Um, and then uh, with the family-based approach, they cover a lot of what Teresa has already mentioned around, you know, ha the environment around meal times and the routines around meal times, and uh, following your your child's lead as well. So I won't elaborate on that. Um, another part of of or another psychological support, uh, a big one, is focusing on you as a parent and your own nervous system response to your child. I think a lot of the time, what I see is. The focus on is on the child you know we become when we are stressed as parents we become very i suppose myopic or or um uh, tunnel visioned about things and we see you know oh my goodness we need to sort this you know and um, i'm going to call the dietitian and we focus on everything except ourselves sometimes whereas um as teresa has said already us and our nervous systems are so immensely important because at the end of the day even if you had a full team around you, right, and they gave you all the, the strategies that you needed, at the end of the day, we are the ones as parents that have to implement these with our child on a daily basis. And if our nervous system um, is, is chaotic, you know, we can't expect to be able to then co-regulate with our child. So, um, and it, it's difficult, don't get me wrong, it is really difficult difficult to regulate your nervous system when your child is is not eating it is very difficult however you know just start small um and and why why is this important yeah because um i mentioned mirror neurons here so what i'm talking about here is um in order to to co-regulate effectively with our child i suppose there there are um neurons in the front part of our brain in the prefrontal cortex that actually mirror the emotion of another person and I'm sure you've had that experience yourself of walking into a room where everyone's maybe either really excited or really down and you almost kind of feel you getting that feeling. It's almost contagious. Uh, it's because um, us as humans, we're wired to connect. And part of that process is the, these mirror neurons um, basically mirror the, the emotions that are going on in another person. And with our children who are highly attuned to our emotional being, uh, they they equally will take on our mood, I suppose. Um, and it's not just waffle or we don't, we're not just making it up. It, there's actually parts of our brain that um, they've discovered that are responsible for this. So that is why our emotional state at the dinner time or whatever is important. Um, so as I, I always use the, the plane analogy. So, I'm, you know, if I used to have a fear of flying, I'm getting better, a lot of graded exposure, but, um, if, for example, I was on a plane and the air hostess or, or God forbid, the pilot was to look, not that I see him, but if the air hostess is, is going is looking really, really freaked out about some turbulence, my nervous system is going to escalate. 
Uh, whereas if there's turbulence and that air hostess is, you know, calm, um, I'll, I'll mirror her. I'll be like, OK, we're OK. And it's the same with our children. So if they see you highly dysregulated around mealtimes, they take your your cue, really. And they're like, oh, OK, food really is anxiety provoking for mom, too. OK, and it can escalate things. Um, and I, I think I've alluded to this already, you know, when we see our children um, struggling with eating, it is very emotive because our parental instinct is to feed our young. Um, there's also a lot of big emotions for parents because of the isolation that exists around this, um, particularly, I think, in Ireland, to be honest, there, you know, that lack of understanding out there um, and lack of, of support can lead to it being quite isolating. Um, so how then do we manage our, our emotions? How do we regulate our big emotions in response to our food? Um, I won't go through everything here, but I suppose the point is here uh, that there isn't just one thing that we can do that will magically calm us down. Um, you know, there, there's lots of different things. And in psychology, we talk about the biopsychosocial model and how there's strategies in all the different areas that can help us to regulate our nervous systems when it comes to helping our child. So, you know, the, we're on about the basics here, I suppose. Are you getting enough physical activity? you know, managing your sleep. Are you eating well? I often see um, in families where where there's ARFID, um, the, the parents' um, eating habits have been interfered with or, or disrupted um, because so much attention is going on their child. Um, and managing your own sensory system as well is important in terms of managing your emotion regulation. Um, from my experience, uh, parents tell me that they really need not just good friends, but friends that actually get it and fully understand what ARFID is. They also tell me that they need friends that are fun, that don't give a hoot about it, that don't want to even talk about it, but that just bring out the, the kind of fun side in them. Um, they find it helpful to inform school about it, give them the updated kind of info on ARFID. This is not just picky, picky eating or selective eating. This is actually, you know, a real thing. And you need to actually inform your, your you know, health, health eating policy or adapt it for my child because of this. Um, it's important to educate family and close friends. Um, having maybe a, a food diary, uh, like keeping a list of your child's preferred foods so that you have it ready to go if they're going to a friend's house or into school or wherever. Um, and then maybe accessing your own psychological support, um, maybe questioning. And I find this quite a lot, you know, parents, especially in, initially on their journey uh, with ARFID, they have many uh, very upsetting beliefs like uh, my child will never grow or my child's brain will be underdeveloped. So really trying to, you know, challenge those beliefs and how do I know this is actually true? And, you know, some kind of CBT type exercises are helpful for parents. Online supports that can be helpful. Um, and having your own uh, soothing strategies at mealtimes too. So I know Teresa mentioned there are some lovely ideas around uh, what maybe proprioceptive or sensory based activities you could do for your child before mealtimes. And if you're finding mealtimes stressful, what can you do for yourself and your nervous system? Because by the process of co-regulation, your calm nervous system, you will lend that to your child um, during that mealtime. So maybe a walk around the block, swinging a few kettlebells, whatever your thing is, um, to see if there's something you can implement um, during the day that will give you that nervous system reset um so i'm just conscious of time sorry uh, but i will quickly fly through this so um just in terms of managing anxiety in your child so i suppose we really need to believe their anxiety i know it might seem completely irrational to to an adult brain but it is real to them so um acknowledging that i suppose and telling them that you know this is scary and i'm here to help you rather than of course you won't vomit or of course you won't feel funny, you know, rather than dismissing it. So that's what I mean by getting into their anxiety rather than trying to shut it down because we can't shut down a feeling anyway. You know, your child is going to feel it. We cannot pull a feeling out of our child. Um, validate their experience. Um, as uh, Teresa has already said, developing a sense of safety and control around food is really important. So including safe foods in their meals, giving them control, reducing the pressure, 
creating a predictable routine um, and using maybe safe, you know, their favorite spoon or fork or whatever it might be, creating a calming environment. And also, as um, Teresa has mentioned as well, soothing items or soothing strategies um, are, are very helpful during meal times. And I always mention the, the DOSE acronym to parents. So dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin and endorphins, they're all our feel good chemicals. And how basically can I create these happy chemicals in our child? Because if their child has more of these happy chemicals in their body, they will be more relaxed around meal times and feeding. So things like play, hugs, co-regulation, physical activity, music, massage, sensory input, anything to get these happy chemicals boosted in our child's um, system. So I'll hand you back over to Teresa now. Thanks, Loda. I am going to just skim over these slides because I know probably lots of us, myself included, are approaching during bedtime. Um, I suppose I just wanted to finish on a positive note and try to empower you with some strategies for success when you're working with your own children at home with Arfid. Um, I'm going to start with what not to do, which might sound a little bit strange, but I suppose some of these um, some of these points of information, and I will call them some myths, uh, are still circulating in quite a few environments, which is a little bit concerning. And parents tell me all the time that they have been given some of these messages and different pieces of advice. So I suppose I just want to kind of dispel some of these before moving on to what, what I would advise you to do instead. The number one point is never, ever, ever let your child with ARFID go hungry in the hope that they will eventually eat. This is hugely dangerous because as we already referred to, children with ARFID don't have those same hunger signals. So that this will not work in short terms. It doesn't work. Um, as much as we all do it, you know, pressure, pressuring the child to eat, even if it's just in a gentle way, ah, just take one more bite, just finish what's there. Or if you eat that now, we'll have dessert afterwards. Just have that first and we'll have something nice. As uh, innocent as this pressure might seem, it all contributes to the ongoing cycle of anxiety and food refusal. Withholding safe or preferred foods to encourage the child to attempt to eat new foods is also a major no-go. Um, lots of people, and I have tried this myself with my own children in the past, disguising foods, doing the, the hidden pasta sauce. I once tried putting cauliflower into a uh, pesto and it backfired so badly on me that my children still remind me of the time I tried to do it to them. Um, it doesn't work again. And okay, it might work one time, but then as I found out myself, when you get caught out, then you lose the trust of your children and they will forever think you're trying to trick them again when it comes to food. So I don't advise that. Uh, also rewards and bribes, the research shows these do not work with children with ARFID. So I probably just wouldn't waste your own energy doing it because children with ARFID don't respond to that reward system. So then we'll move on to strategies with success. Um, this here is my second little boy when he was um, starting to eat solids and I can tell he was very much in his zone of uh, emotional security there as he was horsing into his baby snacks. I would suggest um, when you're, you know, trying to work on uh, your child's feeding challenges in an ARFID context and, and your own kind of journey around this as well, have a think about what your feeding goals are for your child. So in this moment, wherever they are in their, their diagnosis, or maybe they haven't even been diagnosed yet, but you know you're on that path. Think about, do you, does your child at this time need to eat more of the foods that they do eat or do you want them to expand the range of foods they eat or do you want them to be able to eat more of their preferred foods but in a range of different environments? So have a think about that. That will automatically reduce the overwhelm for you and your child and for other caregivers, for school, for everybody. And that will also help you to manage your own expectations and the expectations of others. So for example, if your child is only eating five foods at the moment, would we want them to eat more of those? That's okay. And if that's where they're at, that is fine. Um, on that, also on that theme, all food is equal. There are no bad foods when it comes to ARFID because all foods are a form of nutrition and um, they're all a form of uh, nourishment and keeping the child going. So there is, if, if all your child eats is packets of biscuits, pom bears, 
I don't know, I'm trying to think of the most processed things that can pop into my head. That is all good. And we celebrate every new food that a child eats in my clinic. I suppose the last two points I'll talk about together. In my experience, I don't know that you're going to find this out in the research, but I have found that with children and young people with RFIT, they can tend to go through cycles. And sometimes things will be very hard and they might reduce their list of preferred foods down to only a couple of foods. And this is really, really, really hard. And this is when families come to me in the trenches and they say, we are dropping foods big time. We are so worried. But then I tell parents, you know, as easy as it is for me to say, don't panic because generally the child then will after a while move out of this cycle and they do get to a point where they will have a window of tolerance of being able to consider new foods and maybe even trying them. And so I think once parents know that this cycle occurs, it can give them number one relief. And also it can give them that encouragement that when the child is ready, you will be able to try new foods or you will be able to maybe try new environments. Um, and it's about getting to know your own child's window and what that looks like and what that readiness looks like. The other thing I want to talk about is empathy. And so this is a, a double edged perspective on things for yourselves as caregivers. We've talked about this already, but. I say to parents, ARFID and feeding difficulties are really thankless because every day you get up and every day you make the dinner and nine times out of 10, it could end up in the bin or every day you send the lunch to school and every day it comes home. And it is, it's, I think as an occupational therapist, I've worked with many different diagnoses over the years, but I think feeding is possibly one of the hardest for caregivers. It is so thankless and it's so isolating and there isn't that much understanding from other people. Concurrently to that then, for the child, as we've outlined already, and you watched that video, like I could feel my own anxiety levels rising in the one minute that I watched that video. Imagine being that child all the time. And I say to parents, for these children with these complex feeding difficulties, I imagine the world can be a very scary place at times. And I think once we have that empathy perspective for ourselves and for the child it automatically helps us change our relationship with the ARFA diagnosis and going back to that feeding relationship as well I want to talk about internal motivators for a second so the little boy um on the left is my eldest little boy and he is doesn't have ARFA but he does have uh definitely feeding challenges and has always had and so for years, he did not want to eat. When he was little, he didn't want to eat ice cream because he didn't, it was too cold. He never, ever wanted to have it. But then we would go as a family and we'd get ice cream and, you know, we might get a coffee. And he saw his brother getting sprinkles and blue ice cream and pink ice cream. And he realized this was, there was something good to be had at the ice cream shop. And he'd be standing there with his bottle of water because that was all he wanted. And he realized he was getting the short end of the straw. So I think he realized he wanted in on the ice cream. And one day he came to us and he said, I... I want an ice cream. And we said, okay, that's fine. Yep, you can have one. We didn't make a big thing out of it. We didn't make a big song and dance. But um, this, look, the, the ultimate result was he devoured the ice cream and now he loves them. So I suppose this is a very simplistic way of saying that there are um, internal motivators that will drive your child to eat and they will always be a million times more powerful than you or I wanting them to eat. So um, instances that I've come across are children who want to be able to go to McDonald's with their friends. And so they will be able in time to overcome their own anxiety and stress and fear of maybe eating in a busy place or in a smelly place because they just want to be able to go to McDonald's with their friends or they want to be able to eat the pizza at the birthday party. They want to share in that enjoyment and that fun. So don't underestimate trying to find what might motivate your child. As I said already, you provide and the child decides. Once you remember that, you can't really go too far on. All you can do is allow your child to meet a variety of foods consistently, and then they will decide if they are ready at that time to eat it or not. The last thing I would say is stay the path and go slowly. And when you think you're going slowly, go half as slow as that again. In my experience, change is always possible with these children, but it is very, very slow. And you hear a lot nowadays about being trauma informed and neuro affirmative. And in my experience on the ground, the most affirmative and trauma informed way that we can work with children with ARFID 
is to just go as slowly and baby steps as you can. And I always say to parents, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And that's all you can do in that moment. And change is always possible. And take it from me because some of the families I have worked with, I don't know if I would have believed the change was possible, but it is. So just stay the course and don't despair. Lastly, we've just listed some resources here that myself and Rebecca have collated. We haven't put too many in uh, for two reasons, because it's probably not a massive wealth of resources that we both felt we wanted to recommend. But the ones that are there, we both I use all the time and, and Rebecca does as well. And they're both quite evidence based and informed. So we're happy to stand over these. The first uh, resource that I've listed here, and um, this is the first time I've told anybody about this, it's something I'm very excited about. I have been working away in the background for a very long time on developing um, an ARFID parent resource, purely because I meet all these families all the time who are struggling in the trenches with these feeding challenges in relation to ARFID and cannot access the services, or maybe don't have the resources and are struggling to find the help and I have developed this course um, based on my years of working on the ground and I have all of the information in there that I want to be able to give to parents. So I'm very excited about it. It'll be launching in June. And if you go to that um, URL there, the feedingtherapist.co.uk, there is a registration page there where you can get more information. The, the next three are excellent websites. I recommend having a look at all of those and following them on Instagram. Um, on the next page there, I've just listed one book, which I use all the time. It's an excellent book. I would highly recommend that. Um, the 32 Steps to Eating is a, a sensory kind of pathway that I use all the time. Um, we would use as occupational therapists. And it, it very clearly outlines the 32 stages that are involved in getting to the point of actually eating food. So one of the first stages in those 32 steps is actually being able to be in the same room with and to tolerate certain foods. And then you can see all of the progressive stages involved in eating. So it's an excellent way both of recognizing yourself how multifaceted and complex feeding is, but I find it a great resource to share with other family members and the school as well, because it's a lovely way to capture how complex feeding can be for these children. Um, lastly, I just mentioned two uh, Instagram pages there that I really like to follow. I find them both really, really informative. Um, Rebecca might have some more that she'd like to share afterwards, but they they were just ones that we I'd like to kind of follow. So <laughs> we've probably overwhelmed you there with a lot of information. Um, I hope I hope that has been useful and helpful. I think Michelle was sifting busily sifting through the eighty questions that we got yeah. there. When we were <laughs> Why we're busy talking. Michelle. There are so many questions yeah. and I, I really feel like some of them came in right as you were answering them. Uh, okay. And I feel okay. almost like, so what I really want to suggest, because I, I understand that we're running short on time and we've kept you for a good long while. I really want to suggest to please watch this again. It's going to be up on our um, neurodiversityireland.com backslash library. So as soon as we have it ready, it will be up there, I'd say in a couple of days. Um, watch it over again. Look at the resources at the end here. If you're still here right now, scroll down through the chat and look at those Facebook pages that were highlighted because a lot of support comes from other parents. So have a quick look there. Maybe link into those uh, Facebook pages. And there are so many questions, guys, and we've already gone over time. And I just feel like it's not fair to keep you for more. But I, I, I heard you both say that you could do a whole webinar on something. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so I'll be in touch with you again. And um, yeah, I think the biggest thing, I think so much of what I just heard was about really allowing your child to be where they are. Mm -hmm. And like, if they're only going to eat a slice of white bread without butter on it, let them have it. Um, maybe picking plates and things that they might be able to to try if they want to, but with zero pressure. Um, mm -hmm. Those things I think really came across very strongly. And a lot of the questions are related to that. There's a lot of questions related to whether this is tied into PDA. So I'm assuming that that's a maybe. Is that, am I right in thinking that? Yeah, absolutely. And I guess that is um, how you approach it. If they do perceive that feeding is a demand, then yes, it can be. I mean, the, there's an overlap there, certainly. Yeah. Um and again, it's about how you approach it. So reducing the pressure 
and there, there's certain ways uh, again that's probably a whole other webinar like yeah. you like just changing how you use your language and using declarative language rather than instructions and um but but yes there's certain chance of that question there there is an overlap yeah so and then the last thing i'm just going to say because it came up so many times is how do they access supports in ireland because it seems like there's I think you listed a few places where maybe they can access some supports, but I'm assuming that people like yourself are few and far between. So I suppose in the first instance, if your child is linked with the CDNT already, that would be your pathway because there are um, so what we call FEDS teams. So that stands for feeding, eating, drinking and swallowing teams um, in some CDNTs around the country. And there is a uh, a, a, a team for a, sorry a service for children with complex feeding disorders and that's based at the central remedial clinic in dublin however that's a tertiary service so i hope i'm correct and it definitely was when i worked there anyway the the main um referral source of that was through your cdnt so that was your the, the primary referral source was the cdnt and then they would refer if required on to the tertiary service which was the complex feeding clinic in the crc in dublin Thanks outside of that sorry if you're if you're not linked with um if you're not linked with the cdnt because i'm aware lots of people aren't at the moment in our current system i guess your gp is the first port of call in my experience um lots of gps don't have and i don't don't want to generalize but uh, from speaking to gps lots of them don't have an understanding or an awareness yet of ARFID. so if you're going to go to your gp to talk about this i would recommend taking some resource with you just to show that you know you have done your your, your homework on this whether it's something like the book that i recommended there and um, have it beside me or even you know something from the ARFID awareness uk website something like that uh, just to kind of give a background explanation as well yeah there's a lot um, of frustration with cams also mm -hmm. not necessarily yeah. knowing uh much about this so i think you're right i think arm yourself with information before you talk to the professionals mm -hmm. is huge yeah i wouldn't presume i uh, with it because this condition is so new i wouldn't presume anybody mm -hmm. knows what you're talking about and then if they do it's a bonus great yeah, yeah. All right, ladies, I know you've got places to be and I really appreciate your time and staying over for as long as you have and everybody else out there, the questions are gonna go to them anyway. I'm hoping that we'll do this again. I don't know when, but um, we'll keep you posted. Uh, tune into neurodiversityireland.com to our library to see new things coming up. We're doing webinars every week or two. Um, and so we're gonna do as much as we can to provide you with, with information online so you can know where to look in the future. Thanks so Thanks. much, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Have a good night, guys. Thank you.